Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our first uh, in-person literary cafe. My name is Helen Liu and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to uh, take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. The Literary Cafe was created by the Foundation and they are pleased to collaborate with Marjan Kamali on this series. Books by our authors are available for purchase at the back of the table by Maxima Book Center. Our authors will also be happy to sign the books this evening. We'd love to hear your questions and comments, um, but we've saved time at the end of the program for that. So now I'd like to introduce our host. Marjan Kamali is the author of the national bestseller, The Stationery Shop, which is being adapted into an HBO series and Together Tea, which was a Massachusetts Book Award finalist. Her novels have been translated in over 20 languages. Born in Turkey to Iranian parents, Kamali spent her childhood in Turkey, Iran, Germany, Kenya, and the US. She is a 2022 recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Creative Writing Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Marjan Kamali, who is going to introduce our guests for the evening. Thank you so much, Helen, and thank you to all of you for coming here. This is Carrie Library's first in-person literary cafe, and you know, we're getting back on our feet here. I know people are still a little bit hesitant to attend in-person events as we're in this in-between stage, but I'm thrilled that every single one of you is here tonight. Thank you to Lex Media for being here. They're recording it. Um, so that people who aren't comfortable coming or couldn't make it can watch it later. And it's just an honor to be part of this literary cafe. It gives us a chance to talk to so many great authors in the Boston area and beyond and to kind of delve deep into a certain topic. So those of you who are friends of the literary cafe know that we had our inaugural um, event back in February. That was back when we were still on Zoom in the Omicron surge. We had Michael Blanding. We talked about Shakespeare. And tonight's um, topic is climate fiction. So, you know, when this topic came up, uh, a few of us in the Cary Library Foundation were chatting and some didn't know about climate fiction. They hadn't yet heard of it. I think a lot of you have heard of science fiction, sci-fi. Well, there's Cli-Fi. Um, in the past 10 years, a very uh, fastly growing uh, number of books written about the climate. Um, I guess the definition of climate fiction is, put simply, climate fiction is a growing branch of literature that deals with the effects of climate change on human society. So tonight we're going to discuss climate fiction, the evolving role of climate in literature, how to find inspiration when dealing with a complicated subject, and the relationship between nature and fiction. And I thought we'd start by having each one of our authors tell us a little bit about their current book and um, do a short reading. And then the three of us will be in conversation, and then I'll open it up to all of you. And we're going to wrap up um, certainly by 8.30. And I hope that you all um, help us out with Maxima Books, our lovely local indie bookstore here in Lexington. We are so excited to have a local independent bookseller again in, in the center. And um, our authors will be signing their books. All right, so um, when you have two authors, it's always a question of who goes first. So we're doing it alphabetically. Um, I would love for Julie to start us off this evening. Julie Carrick Dalton um, is the author of the debut novel, Waiting for the Night Song, which was named to most anticipated book lists by CNN, Newsweek, USA Today, Parade, BuzzFeed, and others and was an Amazon editor's pick for best books of the month. Um, her writing has appeared in the Boston Globe, Business Week, Chicago Review of Books, Orion Magazine, Electric Literature, and other publications. A Tin House, Breadloaf, and Grub Street Novel Incubator alum 
Julie is a member of the Climate Fiction Writers League and is a frequent speaker and workshop leader on the topic of fiction in the age of climate crisis. She contributes to the Writer on Box and Dead Darlings Writers Blogs, mom to four kids and two dogs. Julie also farms attractive land in rural New Hampshire. She's also a farmer. Um, her second novel, The Last Beekeeper, will be released in March of 2023. So everybody, please welcome Julie Clark Dalton. Thank you, Marjan. It's so nice to be here in public um, with pe real people. We've done so many events on Zoom, and this just feels really nice to be here with you. And thank you to the library for hosting. So um, I'll tell you just a, a little bit about the book, and then I'm just going to read a short passage for you. So Waiting for the Night Song, it's my debut novel. It came out in 2021. Um, and it's primarily st a story about a complicated friendship between two women. And it's, there's the secrets and betrayals and redemption. There might be a body in the woods somewhere. Um, but the whole book is set against the backdrop of a slowly changing climate in a small farm town in New Hampshire. And the setting is inspired by the area where the land I farm is. Um, so the story is told in two timelines. It goes back and forth between my main character, Katie, when she is 11 years old and when she's in her 30s. So I'm going to read you um, a short bit from the beginning of chapter two. Um, and this is Katie's voice when she's 11. So this is the first time that the, um, you, the, the reader will meet Katie when she's 11 years old. Now I need to put my glasses on. <laughs> yeah, I, I should. <laughs> yeah, I will get nowhere if I don't put my glasses on. <laughs> yeah. So this is chapter two. The warped floorboards in the kitchen played like a piano under Katie's feet. If she maintained her rhythm and bounced from the long board in front of the sink to the short plank behind her father's chair to that narrow strip in the middle of the room, she could coax out the melody of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on the moaning, creaking wood. Standing at the threshold between the kitchen and the hallway, Katie mapped her route across the kitchen, seeking out the stiff, mute boards that promised silent passage to the door on the other side of the room. Thin light filtered in through the muslin curtains a familiar angle of 6.30 a.m. Katie often stole mornings while her parents slept to practice in case she ever needed to escape from something. What she would need to escape from, she didn't know yet. Notice your surroundings. Know your escape route, like Sherlock Holmes. With six leaps, she landed in front of the screen door and eased it open, enough to squeeze her torso through. If she opened it one inch too far, the squeak would alert her parents. Outside, a frothy mist hung over the lake. She tiptoed out to the end of the rickety pier and sat, letting her feet dip into the tepid water. At first, Katie didn't notice the boat, half obscured by the fog. But as it crept closer, the small vessel broke through the gauzy curtain, a yellow rowboat drifting alone with no captain, no passengers. She stood up to see inside. Maybe someone lay on the bottom, a lost child, maybe a murderer ready to jump out and grab her. Pressing up on her toes, stretching as far as she dared over the water, she still couldn't see inside. The boat floated closer, closer, and then it passed by her pier on the barely noticeable current without pause. The morning sun infused the mist with a creamy, molten glow. Pressure swelled inside Katie's ribcage. A longing rippled through her muscles and clung to her bones, pulling her toward that boat as if the universe needed her to act. She hesitated. If she went inside to ask permission, it would be gone, disappeared into the clouds like a dream she would never remember. She peeled off her pajama top and shorts and looked back at the house. Her toes curled around the edge of the warped gray boards, clinging to the rules she always obeyed. She filled her chest with the misty air, pinched her nose, and she jumped. So that's the moment that launches everything in the story, all the good things and all the bad things that Katie experiences are all go back to that moment when she made the decision to jump in the water. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. So many good things and bad things. Honestly, it's the kind of book where you think things are resolved and then they're not. Because <laughs> something else just pops up and really kept me on my toes um, and couldn't, couldn't put it down. So thank you for that. And now Erica. Um, dear Erica, award-winning novelist Erica Ferenczek has received glowing critical praise for her literary thrillers 
featuring women who face extreme physical challenges in nature, even as they grapple with internal struggles. Devoted to authenticity in her craft, Erica spent weeks in the wilderness of northern Maine as research for her debut novel, The River at Night, an indie next pick that New York Times bestselling author Ruth Ware called raw, relentless, and heart-poundingly real, for her hair-raisingly vivid, that's from Kirkus Reviews, follow-up, Into the Jungle, Ferencic journeyed 100 miles up the Amazon to experience firsthand the lush and perilous Peruvian jungle. Now, inspired and informed by a month-long trip to Greenland, Ferencic sets the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and Wall Street Journal's editor's pick, Girl in Ice, um, maybe I should wear the black. <laughs> um, in one of the most unforgiving, unforgettable landscapes imaginable. Please welcome Eric Fenson. Thank you. Wow, sounds like I got a, I got a real death wish, huh? <laughs> I'm working that. Um, so, Girl in Ice is, which came out about a month ago, Girl in Ice is about an American linguist who travels hundreds of miles north of the Arctic Circle to an extremely remote climate research center off the coast of Greenland, where a girl has thawed from a glacier alive, speaking a language no one understands. Eight months before the story begins, Val's twin brother, who was a climate scientist, walked out middle of the night, Arctic night, 50 degrees below zero, and froze to death. Val doesn't know uh, if Andy took his life or if there was foul play involved. So the story begins um, when Val receives an email from uh, another climate scientist, Wyatt, one of the only other people up there when, when Andy walked out, telling her about this girl, telling her that they found the girl, she's talking, 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 but no one understands a word that she says and that Val is really the only person that can come up there and try to understand it because Val specializes in these dead Nordic languages. But Val has her own issues. She has her own problems. She has severe anxiety, which keeps her in, comfortable in only a few places. So she initially says no, but in the email is a little clip of the girl speaking, and she plays that. And that moment is when she makes her mind up because she doesn't understand what the girl is saying, but she hears pain and terror and a cry for help from this girl. So for the first time, she feels that she can use her powers as a linguist to actually help another human being. So I'm going to read an extremely short passage. Um, this takes place, another person that was up there when they found this girl, her name was Jean. She's a mechanic, she's kind of the grunt up there, fixing everything, and also she's the cook. So she was there when the girl thought out alive, and she's describing to Val in this scene what it was like for the girl to thaw out. I'll try to do this with two hands here and to turn pages too, okay. So this is, again, this is Jean speaking. Her skin was so cold, but not hard anymore. It was softening by the minute, but we, had to give it, but we had to give her time because, you know, things thaw from the outside in, so we were patient. Soon we checked for breathing or a pulse. Of course there was nothing, so I was getting nervous. I couldn't believe we were disrespecting a body like this, a body that had been at peace in the ice. What were we going to do now? If she was dead and it sure looked like it, how would we bury her in the frozen ground? Then her left hand twitched under the blanket. We both yelped and jumped back. After a while, I thought we both imagined it, but then her jaw dropped and her mouth opened and closed. So we checked for a heartbeat, nothing. Boom, right away, Wyatt was on her with the defibrillator. Just about bounced her off the table, she's so small. He did it again and nothing. She wasn't breathing. Her eyes still glazed over, both her hands still, like what we'd seen was just some side effect of a body thawing, and I begged him to stop, but he wouldn't. 
I begged him in Francis's honor, Francis was my daughter, to stop. I said, Wyatt, maybe this is some rigor mortis thing setting in. Just, just leave her be. Must have been the tenth try. Something changed. You could feel it in the room. This crackling energy filled it up. Wyatt was looking down at her, smiling. From where I saw, sat, I saw her hand shoot up and sort of smack his arm. And I screamed and jumped and ran over. The girl was coughing and gagging, threw up all over the floor, but she was breathing. She was breathing. Wyatt, I mean, he was spattered with puke, but he had this look of rapture, like he was in his own sort of church. Standing next to him like that, watching her try to catch her breath, this little filthy naked child, hair in knots, I felt like, in a weird way, we were her parents, or her second set of parents, you know what I'm saying? I mean, he started her little heart, but we worked together to bring her out of the ice, to bring her alive. Think about that. Thank you, Erica. Um, so these two novels, I know, I know the two of you have done a couple of events together. I just, I find them so interesting to read side by side because we go from the ice in the Arctic to fires in New Hampshire, and it's a really good dose of um, excitement and suspense, but also the reality of climate change. So one thing I wanted to ask both of you, you know, it's been said that in the future, in the very near future, all fiction will be climate fiction um, because it's going to be difficult to write about a protagonist and how their life is affected by circumstances without including climate because soon it's going to be that uh, sort of universal for every one of us. What do you see as the revolving role of climate in literature? We'll start with Julie. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so I, I agree. Climate fiction isn't necessarily new. I mean, we were seeing it from, you know, most famously Octavia Butler um, and lots of people between then and now. But it's coming from all over the place now. We're seeing it in romance novels. We're seeing it come in thrillers and dystopian, apocalyptic stories, disaster stories, um, futuristic stories. And my story is a very contemporary novel. It's um, based on real science. It's happening right now. And the, the whole range, I think the reason um, is that we're all experiencing it in different ways. And if we're not experiencing it, maybe we're wondering why we're not or, or when we're going to be experiencing it more. And I think it helps, um, so Jeff Vandermeer is an author who wrote, if any of you read the book or saw the movie Annihilation, and he's written Born and a bunch of other novels. He was interviewed in an article and said that um, novels can be laboratories for the future. And I love that because I think of climate stories as you know potentially being laboratories for the futures we can imagine, whether they're good futures or bad futures, and if we want to change the way we live um, and avoid those futures or live into these futures. And I think that it's a way to invite people into the conversation. It's a way to invite people to imagine a, a, a different way that we could, you know, a different future that we could have. Yeah, that definitely came through in your in waiting for the night song. And I guess when we look back and a lot of what we considered science fiction, um, all these dystopian futures that sadly are now closer to our own reality, were climate fiction. Um, what, do you, what do you say, Erica? Well, yeah, I mean, I just gotta echo what you guys have said. Um, I think, and it is coming into every, every, con every conceivable genre of fiction, um, I think, we have to, in order to take, in order to address a problem, we have to be able to imagine it. If we can't imagine it, as human beings, it's, it's really hard for us to make a plan and try to address something. And the role of story is, is for one of the roles of story is, which the human brain needs in order to be psychically healthy, is to rehearse, is to rehearse and you know you don't really know maybe you don't aren't aware of it but when you, when you start reading something you're looking for who who you relate to the most in the book like who is the center of good who can you project yourself into and you do it with movies as well are you looking for who to root for and through all the trials and tribulations of 
this protagonist, you're experiencing the same thing. You may be saying, well, I wouldn't do that, what they're doing. But you're, just, you're, you're discovering ways to live. And we need to discover ways to live with climate change. And I, and I do feel like it's hard to imagine a story that um, doesn't take into account this approaching, frankly, catastrophe that we are kind of sleepwalking our way into. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, this book is a combination of thriller, mystery, suspense, it's touches of horror. Um, I think that what, you know, what I just said earlier, you're sort of practicing encountering the monster. You know, what would I do? Would I go down into that basement? No, that's stupid. Or what, I, you know what I'm saying? But you're fig we're, we have to figure out what to do with this monster, and it is a monster. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we used to say to our writing students, please don't leave politics out of the story, because for so long, um, especially beginning writers thought, I shouldn't include politics, as though it's possible for your main character to have their lives not affected by it, and if, even if it is possible, that's political. Um, but now I think the same goes for climate, and you, you both show this so clearly. These are complicated subjects, though. I mean, um, both of you cover not just the effects of climate change, but there's so much more that you're sort of layering into these stories. So um, I guess Julie, when, when I think of your main character in New Hampshire, she has this deep connection to the land. And you write, um, the particular flavor of her lake water and the smell of decaying leaves specific to the area always drew her in with a comfort that teased her like a drug she knew she shouldn't take. Throughout the story, um, I'd say Katie is very much feeling like the millennia, even in the granite of New Hampshire, is a part of her soul. And yet, she's seeing her hometown, Maple Crescent, just pulled into this these horrific changes that no one wants to admit. So how did you approach this? Because it's really hard as a writer, you know, there's the writer part of you and then there's a part of you that wants to beat the person over the head and say, listen, what's happening? How did you approach this complication? Well, I will, I'll say that I didn't start out with the intention of writing about climate. Um, I was writing a story, I was writing a mystery, and um, during the same time that I was writing the book, I was building a farm on a piece of land in New Hampshire. Uh, it was a piece of land that had been on the market. It was near my, we have a family home in New Hampshire, and the land was on the market for timber and development. And it's a 100-acre piece of land that we have bear, we have moose, they walk into my yard, and I value this land. And when it, they started clear cutting it, the only thing I could do was buy the land. I had a partner, we decided we're gonna be farmers. Like we had no business becoming farmers, but I needed to save the land. So that piece of land had already been a little bit, about five acres cleared. And so while I was writing this book, the whole time, it took 13 years to write this book, I was building a farm. And I was in, out working, you know, digging, moving rocks, you know, building fences and getting dirty, getting to know my land, researching agriculture in the region. And the land like just worked its way under my fingernails inside of my mind and my brain. And I couldn't tell a story that wasn't about that at this point. Um, and I, I did, I wanted to beat people over the head. And the thing that really set it in motion was that I discovered this one nugget of information that in my growing region in New Hampshire, the um, average summer temperatures have gone up by four degrees in the past century, which is disproportionate to the rest of the country. And that means my growing season is 22 days longer for a farm. That's crazy as you think about how that affects what grows, what doesn't grow. And that was the thing that set me on fire because nobody thinks of New Hampshire as like the epicenter of the climate crisis, but it's a slow burn and it's affecting the sugar maples in New Hampshire. It's affecting the um, animals that are endangered and invasive species that are moving in, which is a big theme in my story. 
Um, so I did want to beat people over the head, and I, had, I threw some climate deniers in the book, and I wanted to have conversations with them. And I didn't want to have exact answers either, because I don't claim to have the answers. I did a lot of research, but there are people in the story that are scientists with different ideas about what's happening, and I think it's important to be in dialogue and listen to each other, even if you really don't, dis if you don't agree with somebody. You can't just yell at them. You have to have a conversation or nobody's going to... Nobody's going to listen. So that part's hard, though, because I really want to yell sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the beauty of fiction, because you can populate the story with characters that may not hold your own point of view. And, you know, with Katie, she feels so strongly about everything, but then I, I guess with Piper, who, toward the end, you know, even as a reader, when you read this alternate approach, it is refreshing, though, because you know, at least it made me think, like, okay, well, I guess that's another way of handling these forest fires. Can I add one more thing that this other scientist, Piper, they're both good scientists. They just have different ideas about how to handle this invasive beetle that's moving in, that's setting the stage for forest fires. And I came up with that plot line by eavesdropping on entomology Twitter, which <laughs> might sound boring to you, but oh no, entomology <laughs> Twitter is where it's at. It is very interesting. And so these scientists were, um, not arguing, but having a conversation via Twitter about how to approach this very specific beetle. And that's what I was like, oh, I need both of these stories. I need both of these scientists in my book. That's where it came from. I love that. I, I know my nephew's studying astrophysics, and he told me there's nothing like astrophysics Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I'll look into that. But that that's so cool. Um, Erica, you, I mean, obviously you're also approaching this complicated uh, subject, and when when we're with Val, we're really in the Arctic, and I, I love how you, I mean, I was cold reading the book, I was freezing. <laughs> also from the scariness and suspense, I think I lost a couple of pounds. Um, <laughs> So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this, this gorgeous, uh, just couple of sentences. Across an infinite horizon and countless shades of blue and white, land became indistinguishable from the sky. We were in it now, what I privately refer to as the enormity, an emotional or physical place so overwhelming I couldn't face it without drugs or alcohol. Well, that's Val's <laughs> own personal journey. Um, she later is forced to uh, do just that, face it without the drugs or the alcohol, but tell me about the enormity, because you were actually in it. Uh, I thought that, I th thought, so the, the character of Val, she's, she's, uh, she has this anxiety disorder. She turns to drugs and alcohol. She had to um, take, and she was, thought she was only going to be in the Arctic a certain time, um, so she didn't really bring enough of what she needed. I. I researched Greenland quite a lot before I went. I read books on it, I saw it online, you know, which is nothing compared to actually going there. And that's the case for pretty much everything in life. When you, you read about it and you go there and you go, oh, okay, right? I mean, so I went there and I just, just the scale, it's just not, it's not a human scale. Uh, the size of the mountains, the size of this, of this ice cap, and the size of the icebergs in the land. And just this feeling, there, you know, Greenland is a third the size, it's the largest island in the world, it's a third the size of Canada. The ice sheet's 1,500 miles um, north to south, 700 miles east to west. Three miles deep at its deepest. Um, so I just thought it would be, and also only 56,000 people live there. How many people live in Lexington? <laughs> that is, so around whatever, so like, no one lives there. So I just thought that the Val might react to what she was seeing uh, with her uh, physically, the same way that she reacted emotionally to not being able to process the death of her brother, probably because there was no closure. She wasn't really sure what happened to her brother. Um, so I came up with that concept, and she does refer to it. Um, I think we all feel sometimes overwhelmed 
by the enormity, right? There is the enormity. Uh, and I guess we could make a reference to climate change. What the hell do we do about it as individuals? It's, it's too enormous. Um, so I think that that's what that referred to. And I, also I just wanted to add that, um, and I know Julie would agree with this, is that you probably would do. Um, we don't just in, in, like inject climate change in our stories, you know. The, the story always comes first. And so it's not up to us to come up here and, and preach to you about climate change. You know, I, I consider myself someone who creates entertainment as, as simple and as complex as that is. And believe me, it's complex <laughs> to create a story that will engage you. As much as we're so surrounded by stories, it's like music. You hear, you know, box cantata and you're like, oh, I can do that, that's easy, right? Because it just sounds so beautiful and so simple in its own way. But um, writing an original story is, is incredibly difficult, as, as the writers in the audience know and, and hear. Did I cover that? Yeah, I kind of went off track. Okay. I, I don't think you went off track. Um, you were on track and you covered it Thank very you. well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting what you say, Erica, because it doesn't at all with neither of these books, it doesn't feel as though you slapped on climate change. But right. it's the story, it's, it's Katie's story, it's Val's story, it's the story of the relationships they have, the friendship, the sibling relationship, the relationship with the girl, and it's it's Climate change is just part of that, which, you know, is is how I think for the reader then it becomes cathartic to read these stories. Yes. Yeah. Because it's kind of what you said, to think about climate change every day, watching things on the news can make you feel so removed and helpless. But when you're in the throes of the story, then I think it, in a way, for the reader to, what you were saying at the beginning, you become the character, right. and, and there's a catharsis and almost a comfort. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the progression of my three books, my debut, The River at Night, which I wrote, wrote about 10 years ago, I think, to Into the Jungle. So in The River at Night, there isn't a lot of climate change elements. Into the Jungle, a lot more. And now, Girl and Ice, it's so much more of my, my consciousness. I don't know about you, but 15 years ago, I wasn't thinking about climate change very much, and now it's every other thought I have. So, um, you know, it's part of our, re it's, like, it's like war, it's like war. It's a, it's a reality. So. This is magical because you just segued into my next question. Oh, no, no. Did, I, did, I, did, I, did I screw it up? No, you made it better. You made it better. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Thanks, it's my job, making it better. Um, okay. I was going to ask you, Julie, about the things you've been thinking about. Uh, see, the thing is, um, when, when we write these books, sometimes people assume that once the book is out, we're out and about, we're reading so much from it at events and such and for interviews. But when you're writing the book, these 13 years that you spent writing Waiting for the Night Song, or for Erica, River at Night, Into the Jungle, Girl in Ice, um, for each book, I think for every writer, and I know there are writers in the audience, you're writing what's on top of your mind at that time, right? And Jamaica Kincaid was asked in this recent interview in the Paris Review whether, you know, she goes back and reads her books, and she said, not really, because I said what I needed to say at the time, and now I've moved on. So I was wondering for you, uh, with Waiting for the Night Song, like I know you got a lot that you were processing at the time out. How did it kind of change you to write the book? That's a really good question. Um, I think I, the book changed me, uh, the farm changed me, the book changed the farm, and I think the farm changed the books. Like the three of us were in this like romantic triangle together that as I was doing research for the for the, um, for the farm, it showed up in my book, but also elements that I was exploring creatively in the book gave me ideas for things I wanted to do on my farm. So I think that they were the farm, and also was raising four small children who had a lot to say at the time too, but I won't go into that part of it. But I feel like all those parts of me were in conversation in my head all the time. 
I was thinking about the story, like Eric was saying, because it's always the story. Um, but how did I, how was I going to tell the story that was on my heart? Because the story that was inside me wasn't Katie's story, it was my story. But how do I translate that into a book about characters that people care about? And will I make people care about the things I care about? And I'll, I'll, I'll share a short example that um, w there are politics in my book, um, there's science in my book. Uh, and when it first came out, a reviewer posted a review of the book, and it's the opening lines of the review were something to the effect of, I'm not interested in books about politics, and I don't really pay that much attention to climate change. So I'm like, well, this is going to be a great review. And I was really, so I braced myself, and I read on, and I said, but, but I really cared about the characters. I really cared about the story. I cared about what happened to the characters. So by the end, I was caring about what they cared about, and now I care about climate change. And I think that's what a story can do. I think that and that was what was on my heart, and I wasn't intentionally trying to, you know, change someone in a particular way. But my getting my story out there was sharing sharing what was on my heart, and that it, it moved one person. I don't know about anybody else, but that that was a win for me. Yeah, no, I love that. And also, you mentioned your kids, and I know just um, from stalking you a little bit that. Uh, <laughs> Your kids helped shape the story because it was picking blueberries with them that kind of triggered the inciting incident of the book, right? Yeah, can I share that real quick? Yeah. Um, so I had these, these four children, and I used to take them out blueberry picking on a canoe on the lake where we live. And um, we would just, these big open stretches of land, and we would pick all these blueberries. And it was great, kids just picking blueberries, and we'd make waffles and things. Um, but then they started asking me if we were stealing them because it wasn't our land. It was just these big open stretches. And people just do that on lakes in New England. They just pick some berries. And so I started making up rules for my kids about why it was okay that we were taking blueberries. Like, oh, if you don't get out of the boat, you're not trespassing. And don't take them all. And these things. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, this is really bad parenting here. <laughs> and so I dialed back the bad parenting part. But then I, the what if stuck in my head. And that became the thing that sets in, in motion that rowboat that we, I showed you in the reading that that Katie finds floating, she and her friend start stealing blueberries. And they make up all these rules for why it's OK that they're taking blueberries. So it was just that little moment of um, my local town. I live in Winchester. Our local paper did an interview when the book came out. And um, I told them that story. And the headline in my local paper said, dubious parenting leads to novel. So I am, I am, if anybody asks about the dubious parent of Winchester, it's me. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's kind of why I knew, Julie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd read the article. Um, no, the, I, lo I love that story. I do love that story. Erica, I know, I mean, you freaking went to Greenland, but how did, how did writing the book kind of change you? Um, well, writing this book, I guess it was just, uh, I was indulging myself in, in writing the book that I kind of always wanted to write, I guess, and um, because it just indulged, I call it like my five fascinations. And one of them, first the, the sort of, the way I thought of the book, I was walking behind my house, it was winter of 2018, and uh, there's a, there was a frozen pond, and in the frozen pond, um, at the edge of the pond, there were um, three juvenile painted turtles, frozen mid-stroke, just like this, right? And they didn't look alive, but they didn't look dead either. So I ran home, and I Googled it, and lo and behold, there are creatures that can freeze and thaw out alive. I'm not talking torpid, I'm talking dead, frozen. Um, and these are wood frogs, certain alligators, uh, certain kinds of caterpillars, and so on. So, but turns out that we cannot freeze and thaw out alive. They possess a certain cryoprotein which protects the cells. Because think of an ice cube, when water freezes, it becomes sharp and will break through a cell. Um, so that said, you can freeze an embryo and it thaws out fine. We have that much technology. In any case, I ran home and I just, just thought of a girl in a glacier and I could see her foot and she was running for, from something. And my job was to figure out what is she running from? Why is she running? What's her story? Uh, and I just went back and back from that. So I've always, that was the start of it. Um, another inspiration was a really old version of Frankenstein. 
uh, a black, the black and white version, where Frankenstein, he's the end of the movie, he's bloodied, he's beaten, he, he's sick of humanity, and he's disappearing in this Arctic wilderness, uh, this, this blizzard in Mont Blanc, this black, blocky silhouette. And that has just haunted me, that scene, my entire life, and I'm still trying to parse why something about our inhumanity to our own human variety, something like that. Um, also, this book, I have a love of language, um, I, have, I love science, and I love setting stories on just the edge between what is real and what could be. And so you're reading it, and it, it, it just, it's just so close to what could be that you find yourself believing that a girl can thaw out alive. I mean, I had to write that to convince I had to convince myself, at least for the duration of the, that I was writing it, that it could happen. How do I expect to convince you, right? So um, it changed me to write this book because I had so much fun, and I finally wrote the book that sort of had been in the edge of my consciousness for my entire writing life of 45 years. Not that I'm 45, but you know. <laughs> I'm 25. Just <laughs> you are 25. I'm 25. Um, I'm 15. I'm 5. <laughs> you convinced me <laughs> that girl was frozen in ice. Okay. And I'm not going to give you the spoiler, but she was also defrozen. That's not the spoiler. There's another spoiler. All right, right. Um, you convinced me it can happen. It did happen. Thank it you. Did. You're welcome. Yeah. So that's the beauty of it. What I love, though, you know, people wonder, you know, just what we're talking about. That's why, like, just like our appetite to read is insatiable, mm -hmm. our appetite to write these books is insatiable because you think every time you're writing a new one, you think, this is the book I've always wanted yeah, to true. write. That's true. And this is the time to be. get it all down. It better yeah. be. But then when you finish it, you're like, I just said everything I have to say. <laughs> um, My brain is an empty cell. Yeah, I have nothing left to say to this planet. I, I, I know after I finished Together Tea, I was like, that's it. Like, God, there's <laughs> nothing left for me to say ever again to anyone. Mm, that kind of was. So, <laughs> speaking of the next books, um, you, you didn't think you'd come here and I wouldn't ask okay. that question. What are you working on next? And I know um, the beekeeper, the last beekeeper coming out March 2023. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, The Last Beekeeper is coming out, and I just yesterday got my publication date, so hopefully it'll stick because The Last Beekeeper is slated to come out on uh, March 14th, which is 314, which is pie day. Oh, so anybody who comes to my launch party, we are having a lot of pie. Yeah, we will not schedule this lit cafe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so The Last Beekeeper, I also am a beekeeper. Um, and I've lost a lot of bees um, to colony collapse disorder, so that was the thing that got in my head. It's set in the near future. I don't put a date on it. Um, it feels kind of like it could be next week or it could be maybe in 15 years, but I don't put a, a specific date. That um, I create um, circumstances that our pollinators start dying faster than we think they are. Right now we are afraid they're going to die. We're talking about it. Save the bees. In my book, something happens, um, it's not like a meteor or some big event, but they start dying faster. So instead of having a curve, you know, like this, they go like this. And it sends a world into an agricultural and economic um, crisis. And so the story is about a beekeeper and his daughter and the, how their relationship unravels as the bees are dying and how they find their way back to each other. So it's, again, a lot of me working out grief, climate grief, I think, about thinking about what I'm afraid of and what I've experienced with my own bees. And um, right in the middle of the throes of the final edits of the book right now. So I am in that moment where like, this is it. This is all I've got. Yes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really, really excited about this book. I love it. And um, I can't wait to share it with everybody. We can't wait for it. That's exciting. It's going to be here before we know it. Yeah. Um, that is a good feeling that you're at that stage you're in now where you're like, I just said everything I have to say to the world. And then we'll, we'll talk in a few months. I actually have already pitched two more books, so okay. I have a lot more to say. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Erica, what's going on? What's going on with me is, um, I can't talk too much about it. I can't. Um, it's called The Intelligence, and it's about nature turning on us. 
And that's really, oh, I'm sorry, that's all I can say at this moment. Not because I'm so whatever, it's just, that's just all I got for you right now. You're really smart. I'll talk more later. No, because I was at an event last night and they asked me what the next book was and I basically gave the entire summary plot. <laughs> And I was like, they're just going to go home and write it. But that's okay. That's right. It's better to do what you did. Um, and I, I've already done the research. It, it's a, it was a domestic journey to Oregon, and that's all. That's really that's all I can say. So, yeah. Yeah, with Erica, you always can try and guess what the next book's about based on where she's traveling. <laughs> but you can't with she's Oregon. Going to the so equator. Yeah, no, not with Oregon. No, yeah. not with Oregon. no that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, well, I do want to open it up to Q&A if anybody has questions. I have questions all night long, but I want to open it up to our audience. Um, if you have questions for Erica or Julie about these books, climate fiction, cli-fi, um, the writing process, right? Right. Do you ever, or maybe, actually, let me just grab the microphone oh. so everyone can hear you. Yeah. So I am so not a writer, but I love to read. What happens when the character starts doing something you don't like? Do you um, so there are schools of thought about when you're writing that your characters come alive and take over <laughs> and you, they just come alive and stuff. For me, I would be becoming schizophrenic if that happened. I'm the boss. I made the characters. They do what I want. That's the way I feel about it. You know, just just me. I, I would be actually be might be a fun event if the characters came alive. That would save me a lot of work, maybe. Or maybe I'd have to slap the crap out of them if they they got you know did something I didn't like, but I, I don't have that experience. So, um, in Waiting for the Night Song, I had two characters, I'm not going to name them because I don't want to give anything away, but um, I was really having trouble with one of them that felt very flat, and I wasn't understanding the, his motivations, and so I decided to, um, like, I didn't understand this, like, he wouldn't talk to him, it was like the opposite of him doing things, I, it, like, he wouldn't do anything, like, I didn't get him. So I decided to write a couple chapters from his point of view. I never intended to put them in the book. They're not in the book, but I wanted to get in this guy's head. And when I got inside and could see through his eyes, I realized like, oh, he wouldn't do that. And it changed the entire end of my book. I really reversed two characters' roles in the story because um, they weren't talking to me loud enough and I needed to get like inside their heads instead of them getting inside my head. And so I, um, I have not done that with The Last Beekeeper. I haven't needed to do that, but I, I am very open to slipping inside somebody else's skin and trying to figure out what they're doing if they won't talk to me, because um, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, do, I do slip inside them, but um, I'm ultimately <laughs> boss. the boss. Some climate fiction is uh, deeply dystopian and make, almost makes you want to slit your wrist. I think of something like yeah. American War by Omar al -Akkad. And just the wondering how you walk the line between hope and despair in uh, writing your books. I love that question because the, the terms hope and despair get brought up a lot. I'm talking about not just climate fiction, but, and I feel like there's kind of a, like a false binary that the, a, a, it's either like, like, you know, sugar-coated, everything's happy in the end, and we solve climate crisis, or it's despair and everything's horrible. And I think that like we as humans live kind of in between hope and despair most of the time, and that there is, um, in my books, uh, there's a lot of real science, and it's hard, and it's complicated, and it's not science I want to be real. But I really believe in hope, and I don't mean it in a Pollyanna kind of way. But like, if I don't have hope that we can either do better or be better or, or save some elements of this, you know, this world we have, then like what are we fighting for? Like if I don't believe in hope, if I don't believe that we can change, like why, why bother? And so I, there are a lot of stories that aren't hopeful and I think there are a lot of writers that don't agree with me on this, which is completely fine. Um, that they want to be you know, realistic and throw all the cards on the table, this is what we've got. 
But even in the middle of that, like, I, I, like so if you have a bird feeder and there's 20 beautiful birds on your bird feeder and then the next year only two of those beautiful birds come back, you could like either be paralyzed with grief and mourn all those 18 birds that didn't come back or you could like look at those last two birds and think they're the most beautiful things, what can I do to save them? And so that's kind of what I think about in my books. It's like we've lost a lot, but if we're paralyzed by the horrible things, we aren't going to look at the beautiful things and try to save them. So I'll step off my soapbox now. <laughs> well, I can't have answered the question any more eloquently than that. I mean, um, I, I do know that my publisher would like, they're not crazy about books that end terribly sadly. Um, they like books with flicker of hope in the end. Um, and I think, it, you know, as terrified as we are about all this, we do harbor hope. Um, I hope, I hope we harbor hope that we'll figure something out. Um, I, I admit to, you know, processing a lot of my, my terror and my worries in this book. Um, I have a character, the, um, Andy, the climate scientist, was very depressed about climate change and may have taken his life for that reason. Um, but Val, his sister, steps up to the plate. She goes to Greenland, she's terrified. She figures out what this girl is saying and pretty much saves them both. And it's you know literal, but it's also symbolic. If we can all just do the best we can and go beyond what we think we can do, you know, like World War II and rationing, that's the kind of, you know, we have to do that level of, of change. Um, so, so I guess I could, I could answer it that way. But I don't think it's healthy not to process it. I don't think it's healthy to shun it. I mean, that said, I know there, I mean, there are probably novels that, that I haven't read that are just so damn depressing that, yeah, I wouldn't want to read them either, you know? Um, without any glimmers of, of, of hope. I don't think anyone needs to read that. I don't know if you've read any um, solar punk. Do you know about this, like this new little sub-genre that's kind of the opposite of dystopian. It's like futuristic, but it's like the, the post-climate change genre. I don't read this genre, it's not so, but I actually would like to, to check it out, but I've read about it, and it's like the opposite of dystopian. It's like, we figured it out. We, you know, we're all using wind and solar and everything is, better in the future and it gives us something to hope for and then there's the dystopian apocalyptic stuff on the other end and there's there's a story everywhere on that spectrum I mean there's a place for all those stories because they help us process things yeah I mean I think just like you may prefer a certain kind of story um, that helps you process your life it may have climate fiction elements in there you're gonna just go to go for a certain kind of story we just you know we're just you know projecting or predicting that so much of fiction is going to have climate fiction elements in it. Now that's a massive, massive statement. I mean, in, you know, it could be any genre. It could be a small story about a family, you know, maybe just losing a farm because of a, a pests or something. I mean, you know, sort of similar to what you do. Or it could be a much larger story. It could be romance, it could be anything. Um, but it's still probably going to be in a lot of fiction going forward. Okay, if you don't have any other questions, um, then we're just going to say a huge thank you to both Julie oh, we have oh, to you. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi. Hi, so it's, this was so wonderful. Thank you so much for coming here and uh, doing this. Uh, it was really fascinating. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your writing process, how you approach your day, maybe your week, your month or so, whatever you think might be uh, interesting to hear. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm probably not the best person to ask this because I'm not one of those people that's like, I get up every day at 5 a.m. and write for four hours and then I do yoga. I, there are people who do. I, that's not me. I wrote this book while raising four small people 
And so I was writing in the minivan, um, I was writing in the, the ballet class waiting room and soccer fields and scraps of time that were all, took 13 years and all those scraps made a book. Now my kids are a lot older um, and I have a more time. So I, I go through fits and spurts. I, I, every writer is going to tell you a different story, but um, some, like right now, I'm in it. Like I am so in it. I, as soon as I get home from this event tonight, I'm probably going to go home and write. Like the, the bee book, um, the beekeeper, is taking final shape, and I'm like the whole time I'm talking, there's some there's a dialogue in the back of my head about that other book of things I want to do. So I get in these moments where I, I have a space in my house um, that I can write. I often write at my kitchen counter. Um, I like to be out in nature. I like to go for a walk or even a like hike. Um, these things. It's like, I don't know if it's just the visual stimulation and the air moving my body, but exercising and being outside helps me write a lot when I can do it. Um, but I can also go for three weeks and not write a word if, it, if it's just not happening. So I go through these like, you know, manic fits of writing for eight hours a day, hiking, skiing, being outside, kayaking, coming home, and writing more, and being ecstatically into it to quiet moments when I'm, I'm not writing a whole lot. And I know that a lot of authors are the exact opposite. They're like, every day, get your butt in the chair and write. And I, I can't work like that. And I'm curious about Erica, how, how it works for you. Um, well, deadlines are huge motivators. <laughs> deadlines tied to paychecks are huge motivators for me. Um, I'm, uh, so I'm a, I'm a solid second shifter. You know, I, I work from, say, two to nine six days a week when I'm really working, when I'm, when I'm producing the juice, when I'm writing the actual text. But the, the and I work in a shed, very sexy, right? Um, it's a, a rehab shed, but it's a shed. But it's cool because it has, it, we have a backyard and there's a window. And my husband loves this. I put food out so little animals come, or sometimes larger animals come. <laughs> And I kind of watch them, and I love that. Um, the way I write a book is I come up with an idea. And I often come up with many ideas, and it's really important to vet the idea. Because you will be working on it for 15 years, or, or whatever it is. A minimum of five years. Because you need to come up with the idea, write the first draft, second draft. If it's going to be tra traditionally published, you need a year with them and then you're pushing the book, right? So you need to be passionate about an idea. Absolutely passionate. Because it's got to carry you through it all that time. So I come up with an idea and then I spend three or four months writing an outline. I, I, my outlines are very detailed. The one for uh, Girl and Ice was around 100 pages. Um, I do character studies. I don't keep myself from writing bits of dialogue, anything that comes to me. Uh, and then after that, I go into writing the actual book. I have word counts that I need to hit so that I can hit deadlines. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. Uh, and it's, um, it's great. It's great when it works. It's great when you, when all those different stages like really work, like you're still enthusiastic when you're going to write the actual book and then you're still excited about after the first draft and editor loves it, you know, that's always good. So that's pretty much it. I love hearing other people's process. I, when you, the way you're talking about your outlines, I also, I do an outline, mine are not 100 page long outlines, but I do pretty detailed outlines, but I also graph my books even before I write them. I draw them. So I get um, poster board and I lay them out and on a like grid, a poster board with a grid, and then I map out the chapters. Um, I write both of the books I've written are multiple timelines, so they go back and forth to different timelines. So I color code them. I'm really into colored pencils when I'm writing. Um, so I, like in this book, the uh, past timeline was um, green and the present timeline was red. So I would have I would graph the tension level, of what I thought was like you know the, how the suspense was rising in each chapter. And then I did both timelines and superposed them on top of each other so I could see the way that different timelines were talking to each other. Like, was it all the excitement happening at one time? Should I, you know, slow it down and have one timeline peaking while the other one's about to peak? 
and looking at the way they interact. I'm totally stealing this. I, uh, I'll show you pictures. My, but so here's the funny part with Night Song. I also, there's a love interest. It's not a romance, but there's a love interest. So I graphed the romance element. It's a different graph when it was getting fun. And I graphed the different character arcs. They all had a different color, all in the same graph. So I took it into a writing class with Michelle Hoover. Hi. And I showed her my very beautiful art project. And she looked at it sideways and she goes, huh. will be closing at 30 minutes at 9 o'clock. And she said it looks like a horse running. All the angles, the difference. So it looked like this horse. So when I graphed The Beekeeper, the second book, I did a very similar thing. I made all my graphs, put all the different things on top of each other. And my husband looked at it and he goes, huh, it's a grasshopper. So now I think everything I write has a secret animal embedded in it somewhere. So I'm waiting to see my next book. Like, what's the secret animal going to be? Yeah. I'm like, are they going to start blinking the lights? Yeah. I think we should wrap up. So thank you both. That was amazing. And um, I really did. I love talking to both of you. Thank you all for coming. You're the brave souls. Um, and the, the others will watch it at home. So this will live on. Uh, Brian is here from Maxima Books. Please, uh, our authors will go to the table there. If you want to chat more with them, maybe have your book signed. And thank you so much. And I'm giving away honey. <laughs> Julie's giving away honey.